The city that he builds shall bear my name. The woman that he loves shall bear my child. So it shall be written. So it shall be done. As mean as Ramses is, and as hard-hearted as he is all through the movie, you still love him. That is Yule's personality. Here was a man who was bald. He had the courage and the security to be totally bald and yet be one of the sexiest men that women will today tell you that is the sexiest man I've ever seen. I don't know if he knew how mysterious he was. Uh, all I know is that he was a mesmerizer. He could enchant people. He could dominate people. I'll tell you what I can do. I can kill the first man who so much as whispers a word about getting up. The very first man, so help me, I'll blow his head off. He was the king. You walked into his dressing room and immediately you had the aura that you were in the presence of a great star, a great performer, a great, solid, magnetic personality. It never stopped. There was one story that he started as a gypsy, that he was born in outer Mongolia, that he was born in Switzerland, that he was American, French, Swiss, and several other nationalities. The story I heard was that he was born on the island of Sakhalin, off of the, the island of Japan, and it was an island. Uh, he was born of a black Mongolian gypsy mother who died giving birth to him. His father was Japanese and Swiss. And he told you cuckoo wild stories about being a Mongolian prince, a Mongolian this, a Tartar, all kinds of stuff. No one ever knew. And he liked keeping some sort of mystery and I think that each time he gave an interview he gave a different version of his past and where he was born. He realized early in his career as an actor that interviewers were simply not going to get his complicated childhood story correct. So rather than uh, deal with the errors that they introduced to his story, he employed the full powers of his imagination to create myths about himself. You know, when I think about Yul's past and all the different demons that drove him, I always found it interesting that as close as we were, we talked mostly about the present and mostly about the future. Yul grew up in a, a period of extraordinary turmoil and a place of immense violence. He grew up in Vladivostok and the nearby region in eastern Siberia at a time when the Russian Revolution was spreading to eastern Russia. Yul's father, Boris, left his mother, Marusia, when Yul was about seven or eight years old. And I think a defining moment in his life, according, uh, according to Yul, was when he had looked forward for months to seeing his father Boris visit in Shanghai while the family was there. And he waited and waited and waited and Boris never appeared. He never talked about his father much, and when he did, it wasn't with great tenderness. It was with quite a bit of rejection. When the family fled China for Paris in the 1930s, Paris was the center of the whole white Russian world. His family put him in a, a very strict and very... Uh, uh, famous and well-established school. He l sort of 
left his family life and mother and sister to do their little, you know, cozy life and went off to make a living in different areas. And spent all the time that he could with the gypsy families who performed in a variety of Russian restaurants and, and clubs. And Yule had already come from the Orient with a seven-string gypsy guitar, which he already played, and the gypsies taught him many, many, many songs, which he remembered clearly and would often perform until the end of his life. And then at night he would play the guitar in these gypsy clubs. <laughs> He started being an acrobat at the Cirque d'Hiver. When he was 17 or 18, he fell from the trapeze. They said he would never walk again. But in fact, uh, he was back in the circus a couple months later. Although unable to perform as an acrobat, he began performing as a clown. And it was when he was performing as a clown that he first met his great professor of acting, Michael Chekhov, who was the co-founder of the Moscow Arts Theater with Stanislavski, and with whom you traveled to America in 1941. Through his work with Michael Chekhov, he decided to give acting a, a chance. I don't know how much he really decided that he was going to be a star. Still speaking almost no English, very little English that Ewell began performing small roles in the Shakespearean productions, which played only in colleges and, and very small theaters. And at the same time, Ewell would drive the truck that carried the costumes and sets from one town to another. Ewell was 21, 22 years old. during the war unable to serve in any armed forces because he had tubercular scars on his lungs but performed service for the office of war information and broadcasting news in french broadcast by the voice of freedom overseas and at the same time he was performing some of the same gypsy songs that he'd done in paris at nightclubs around new york Yule was married to a lady named Virginia Gilmore, a very well-known actress. And she had, was in a play with my wife, Ann Jackson, and he had hair in those days. And at night, sometimes after the show, we'd all go out together or go to their house or they'd come to ours. And he would sit and sing wonderful Russian songs, gypsy songs, and play the guitar. My mother, who was already an established film star, not of immense proportions, but she had starred in Jean Renoir's first film in America, Swamp Water, and in a variety of other films, Tall, Dark and Handsome, Western Union, and she had starred in a couple plays on Broadway. She was a great beauty. She was everything that he liked in a woman. She was very feminine. She was an actress. She was involved in his environment and the environment that made him dream. Um, he fell madly in love and knew how to do that quite well. And they soon had a son, which was something that he had hoped for and, and wished for. Somehow or other, uh, having uh, auditioned for parts as an actor, at the very beginning of regular television broadcasting in 1946-47, he landed a job directing television, some of the very first broadcasts. Well, when I first met you, I was an assistant director at CBS in New York television. And I was working with Sidney Lumet, who had been Yule's assistant director. And Yule was a myth to me because Sidney kept telling me these great stories of what it was like to work with him in live TV. Yule always was a nonconformist. Yule always was his own man. Yule had been 
directing two and three dramatic shows a week, but CBS wasn't content with that, so they said, okay, you're going over on Sunday night, and you're going to direct What's My Line. At 10 minutes of 10, Yule just arrived completely calm, and, and then he said to the script girl, I want you to tell me when it's 25 minutes past the hour. So he went on the air with the thing, and he directed camera one on the contestant, camera two on the panel, camera three on the narrator, and he was as bored as one could be doing that kind of thing. At 25 minutes past the hour, the girl said, it's 25 minutes past the hour, Mr. Brenner, and he said, fine. He said, we will do the credits now. And they said, but we have four minutes for the credits. He said, we, we don't do them yet. He said, we're doing them now. So he put all the credits on, and there was still about three and a half minutes to go on the show. And he said, put my credit on the easel there. He said, all right, camera one, he said, my credit. Camera two, he said, go on the audience. He said to the stage manager, cue them to clap. Anyway, they had three minutes of applause with Yule Brenner directed. And the producers were trying to rip the control room door down and the whole thing. I mean, it was just absolute chaos in the studio. At the end of which time, he was never asked back to direct one of those shows again. And it was Yule's idea of saying, hey, don't screw with me. He was directing and he was having a great time and he was surrounded by fantastic people. And through his studies with Michael Chekhov, the doubt came whether he should act or should not act. And people were pushing him to act and he was initially offered to play in Lutzog. And that was a great temptation for him and he did it. Yul continued directing for CBS through Lutzog, which then went on the road. And when he came back to New York, he was directing again. The star for The King and I, per Rodgers and Hammerstein's desire, was Gertrude Lawrence and she was this fantastic actress and this great woman and they were looking for somebody to play opposite Gertrude Lawrence and apparently my father came in for the audition with a guitar in his hand walked onto the stage sat down and started playing the guitar and singing these gypsy songs in front of Rogers and Hammerstein and a group of other people who just could not believe what they were seeing Gertrude Lawrence who was of course the the absolute star of that show when it opened. She was alone above the title. The King has only one complete song, really, participates in two, but uh, the score is virtually, virtually uh, uh, Mrs. Anna alone. But today, nobody remembers anything except Yul Brynner, the King of Siam. It was his friend Irene Sharaf who designed the costumes for the King and I, who said to him, shave your head. And the rest is history. You actually went on directing CBS shows uh, for the first year or so that he was also performing eight shows a week, starring on Broadway. The King and I was, a, was such a great boom, it was such an unexpected huge success that it really propelled him uh, to the forefront of, of the acting career. And I think it was more than anybody could possibly resist. You have been most ungrateful, Tony. What do you mean? He had done one film, uh, You're Better woman. Forgotten, called Perfect. Port of New York lying. in the 1940s. I'm not lying, Paul, I swear it! You're a bad risk, Tony. A very bad trip. But the first film that he actually starred in was The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments had first been made by Cecil B. DeMille in 1923. In 1952, he and Henry Wilcoxon, the man whose autobiography I assisted in writing, decided that they would do a remake of the Ten Commandments for modern audiences in color, Vista Vision, the whole works, and they began a four-year journey of pre-production. There was a big search on for the man to play Ramses, and they had a very, very particular special problem with the Ramses role because 
DeMille wanted it as authentic as possible, and that meant that the leading men would have to shave their heads. The biggest people in contention were William Holden, Michael Wilding, and Michael Rennie. Everybody was sort of biting their lips about what would they look like if they shaved their head, and would the public accept them with shaved heads, in addition to the fact that it was so vital that the men wear eye makeup. All Egyptian men at that time had to wear eye makeup because it was a form of insect repellent, and blindness was a big problem in Egypt. He's agonizing. He looks at people over and over, and he couldn't make a decision on anyone. And he saw Yul Brenner in The King and I. And this man, who had taken years to try to make up his mind between two actors, and this man, who never made a snap judgment, was backstage after the first act telling Yule he was the only person to play Ramses. DeMille had said to Yule, would you like to be in a film that your children and grandchildren will watch with pride 50 years from now? And Indeed, that came true. It will not be the first time that fame has turned a prince against his pharaoh, or that envy has turned a brother against his brother. Envy is for the weak. I don't think there's any other person at that time, and I can't think of anybody now, that could have said those lines, worn those costumes, walk in those platform gold sandals, and had the authority and the bearing had the streak of meanness that Ramses had, and yet as mean as Ramses is, and as hard-hearted as he is all through the movie, you still love him. That is Yule's personality. It comes through. You love this man no matter what he says and no matter what he does. You were saved from the Nile to be a curse upon me. Your shadow fell between me and my father, between me and my fame. And me and my queen. Not many people loved DeMille. People respected him, people feared him, and something very special happened between them. You loved his way of dressing, his way of behaving. DeMille was always impeccable, and I think he drew a lot from DeMille's personality. Remember your firstborn. Death to the slaves! Death to the slaves! Death to their god! Death to their god! Yul well, Brenner was, you know, one of the original mavericks in the entertainment business. He took no disrespect from anyone, no matter how powerful the head of the studio or how large the other star and he had very very little patience with studio heads the suits the um, executives who had no creative power or real creative interest and he regarded them as parasites and he fought them tooth and nail really throughout his film career and frankly I don't remember Walter Lang ever our director giving him a direction other than stand here because this is where your light is I don't think you could tell you anything about that role that he hadn't thought of and 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 uh, chewed and digested and spit out what was so very special about the king as you created the role was that he was an animal imbued with the soul of an angel. Yule was the king. In real life, on film, there was no real difference. I don't think actors ever felt cowed by him once they began to do scenes with him. Deborah Carr was divine with him. She was Anna, in her way, Anna Leonowens. She was, um, hello, dear. You know, always very English and, and on the mark there. My father was getting ready to film Anastasia, and he had per contract approval on the cast for the movie. And his first choice was Ingrid Bergman. Ingrid, per personal choices, as to leave her husband for another man and have 
a child with that other man, was really blacklisted in Hollywood. Yule fought very strongly to have her because he felt she was the right one to incarnate Anastasia. He did the Ten Commandments, The King and I, and Anastasia, all in a period of about 18 months. And all three films opened in 1956, uh, giving him a, a, meteor a meteoric rise to stardom. And he is one of the very few performers ever to have had two nominations as best actor for two separate films, The King and I and Anastasia, and took great delight in the fact that his co-star in Anastasia, Ingrid Bergman, won her second Academy Award for that performance. It's the biggest night of the year in Hollywood as Oscar steps into the spotlight. But he, of course, won the Academy Award as Best Actor for The King and I. I hope they didn't make a mistake in giving this to me because I'm not going to give it back for anything in the world. I think that throughout his career, my father was somewhat typecast following The King and I. People offered him roles that showed him as a strong man, as a macho man. You must remember that you was dealing in a, in a medium, the movies, where he was unique physically, unique with a, a slight accent. His physical aspect was very limiting because he was very strong looking, but the, the fact that he was bald was in some ways a disadvantage. He was not, as he liked to joke, uh, your average clean-cut American kid. And so producers and directors did not normally think of him for conventional roles. I came here today. My father was always proudest of his performance on screen in The Brothers life. Karamazov. I want to change my life. Settle up a certain debt and go away. Find a new life. Going away? With Grushinka? <laughs> You'll never get her. She's coming to me tonight. I'm sure of it. Why is such a man alive? You heard him? Parasite. <laughs> distinguishing characteristic of the man, a willpower that wasn't stopped by pain, by inconvenience, by adversity in the world. I got a, an extraordinary example of that when I was about six years old, when we had indeed gone to Darien to go water skiing for the one afternoon he had off, because he was doing eight shows a week on Broadway and his wardrobe man, Don Lawson, threw him the tow rope and it hit my dad's head and put a big gash in his head. And that was going to ruin our day's water skiing. Instead, he opened the um, fishing tackle kit that he had and he found one fish hook and a little fish fishing line and he found some gaffer's tape so in just a moment or two, he, with the fish hook, put one stitch in the gash in his head, slapped a piece of gaffer's tape over it, jumped in the water, and went right on water skiing. Nobody ever bothered, as far as I can discern, to write roles for Yule. Now, in the old days, that used to happen. They'd say, let's do a vehicle for Clark Gable or let's do a vehicle for Veronica Lake or Lana Turner, whomever. At the time that Yule came into movies, that no longer existed. No one was writing special uh, screenplays for special people. And because of that, Yule's career was very, very limited. Well, casting Yule Brenner in, in films you know, always took a certain amount of 
of creativity and and trust on the part of the filmmakers involved because Yule with his incredibly strong physical appearance and his his intellect that just shone in his eyes and his shaved bald plate brought Yul Brynner and the king to every part. The truth is that I don't think people would have accepted him in anything other than kingly roles. And in a funny way, he was hoisted by his own petard, too, because I don't know that he could play a scene where he had to be vulnerable, truly vulnerable. Yule didn't try to play away from type. He tried to play his strength. And if you look at his string of movies, uh, the only ones that ever were not watchable were the ones where he put some silly hairpiece on, uh, which he only did twice to my knowledge. There was a movie called Solomon and Sheba, which was an enormously expensive production being filmed in Madrid, and Tyron Power, who originally had played Solomon, died, and Buell took over the role. But Buell obviously was bored, had to have a hairpiece, so this hairpiece had to match Tyron Power, and it, the, Buell made a lot of fun of that hairpiece. It was a very expensive production, and I can remember that a lot of Hollywood bigwigs from the studios came and supervised everything. I had just met Yule just before, and when Tyrone Power died and Yule was called in to replace him, he wasn't in very good shape because his marriage had collapsed and he was having a few drinks. My father met my mother, Doris, at a party in Versailles. It was the 50s and it was really the glamorous time and my mother was very well connected in that life in Paris. She knew a lot of people. She was unbelievable beauty and they fell madly in love that same evening. Um, as their relationship evolved and as they got married, I think she brought to him a social life which he wasn't particularly keen on. She was one of Europe's best dressed women. She went to couturiers such as Valentino and Balenciaga, and she brought to him a whole sophistication and taste which he knew about instinctively but didn't really know about materially speaking. And he had this wonderful, this fantastic personality. He was strong, he was gregarious, he was sexy, he was good looking, he, he was talented, he was reliable. He was marvelous. He was marvelous. He was at the prime of, of everything I think anybody can have. I had a wonderful 13-year-old son. And there he was, you know, this hunk of a fella with no hair. We got married in 1960 during the Magnificent Seven. to Kurosawa and bought the rights to the Seven Samurai and brought them to America and sold them to United Artists and it became the Magnificent Seven. New in town? Yeah. Where are you from? Dodge. You? Tombstone. See any action up there? Uh, Tombstone? Same. People all settle down like. Second story window. Curtain moved. I'm not in a good position. Let him stick his neck out. I got nominated real good. We always felt on the set that Steve McQueen was going to become a star, mainly because of his attitude. I mean, there was a kind of an arrogance. Uh, there are scenes when the Magnificent Seven are on their horses going through somewhere, he'd get a twig and ripple the water so your eye concentrated on him. And then he somehow created a feud with Yule in which the papers picked up and then Yule issued a terse statement saying, I never feud with actors, I only feud with studios. 
I, I don't know how to define his ability to function in front of the camera. He felt comfortable with the camera. Also because he knew all the lenses, he knew all about photography, so that when he appeared on the, in front of the camera, he knew exactly where to stand, how to move, and how, how, how to be. Buenas noches. Just a little gesture, huh? Show these people who the real boss is. Not many people know that you and Magnum, the, the uh, famous photography enclave, used to uh, use Yule a lot. He was a wonderful, wonderful photographer. I think Yule enjoyed to be part of both worlds. He certainly was for the underdog and, and he enjoyed being an outsider and, and the gypsy side of his meanderings. But at the same time, he enjoyed all the things that came with the glory of being a big star, which was, you know, going to parties, going to Deauville, you know, play roulette and going very fast cars. When you left America and came to live in Switzerland, saying that it was his country and his father was Swiss, which none of us believed, and he really wanted to be Swiss. Victoria was born in Switzerland. We had a house on the lake with dogs and horses, and it was really a, a wonderful life, water skiing on the lake. But he was a totally unsportive person. He hated to walk, to do anything with He loved to water ski, and which he was beautiful at. He was really very, very, very good. And it was phenomenal what he could do physically. He was one of the most beautifully coordinated men I've ever known. And in his 60s, he could stand upside down, supporting himself by one hand, and do push-ups with his legs toward the ceiling. So I began a stamp collection, and Yule avidly participated in this stamp collection. And we began collecting United Nations refugee stamps. And one thing led to another, and the next thing we knew, he was a special consultant to the United Nations for the refugee problem, for the High Commissioner of Refugees, and was making two television documentaries on the worldwide refugee problem from Hong Kong to the Middle East with Edward R. Murrow, and at the same time doing an extraordinary book of photographs about the problems of refugee children which he did with the uh, incomparable Magnum photographer, Inge Murath. We worked with the CBS, but uh, it was not easy to get entrance to the refugee camps. It certainly wasn't easy to get permits because of sometimes Egyptian army was involved, sometimes Jordanian military were involved, and uh, Yule was absolutely fearless. His gypsy background, which he was very proud of, gave him an incredible sense of belonging to wherever he was. I mean, when he was in America, he was an American. And when he was in France, where he lived for years, he was French. And when he, when he was in China and Japan and the Far East, he was Asian. I was uh, really very uh, um, excited when I was first offered Terrace Bulba, especially since Yul Brenner would be starring as Terrace Bulba. We all set off to uh, Argentina to uh, start the film. Your name, Terrace Bulba, Colonel of the Omansky Cossack. Now, add a motion picture to the wonders of the world. Harold X. Taras Bulba. The story is a, a, a big melodrama between father and son during the Cossack period in, uh, in Russia. The gauchos were magnificent horsemen and we had about 500 to 700 in one shot and it was explained to them 
that uh, if they fell off their horses, they would get a considerable m amount of extra pay. But the people who were to fall were to be selected. Well, then the shot was taken. The obvious happened. Out of f five or six hundred gauchos, about four hundred odd fell to the ground. When that evening they tried to get their money, they were told that they didn't obey the instructions, which were that only the selected horsemen would fall. This upset the gauchos extremely, and uh, they uh, uh, said they would strike. They would not come back the next day. Now, the gauchos lived in the fields with their horses, and that night, Yule Brynner ordered hundreds of stakes, had them sent out there, and he himself went out, and for three hours, he gave a concert to the gauchos, playing and singing Russian songs, French songs, English songs. It was like uh, an Argentinian Woodstock. Well, this so impressed the gauchos, they were so happy about this, they all came back the next day. The first cut that we dubbed, uh, Yule was delighted with. He saw it in Paris, and we dubbed him in Paris, and he was really overwhelmed by it. The next time he saw it, I think he wanted to commit suicide. We uh, sometimes take films that we shouldn't take. If there is one good scene in a film, you think that you can put all the other scenes which aren't so good right. Very rarely works. Two things were playing against him. The business of stereotyping or typecasting, uh, particularly in films, and then the business of doing what comes easiest to you. In a way, you're taking the easy way out. But it is a trap. It's a terrible trap. And it's a trap also because people love you so much in it and you get such accolades and such adulation, such adoration for being that one character. I, that would make me suicidal. I, I would be terribly, terribly depressed. And who knows but that he wasn't. He smoked too much. He would smoke constantly and he just, never really, as far as I remember, made any effort to stop it. He enjoyed smoking and he smoked. Smoking, I think, was a part of his life. It was something you did, it was something glamorous, it was something sexy, and he knew about excess, so he did it with excess. We were talking about how so many people put up these barriers and refused to allow themselves to be ever involved with anybody or anything and particularly in terms of loving a woman and he said you know he said all these people that say they don't want to be hurt he said for God's sake he said being hurt he said you know that reminds me he said of somebody who goes to the greatest restaurant in the world and has the greatest dinner they've ever had and then is upset when the check comes he said being hurt is getting the check. The trouble with you and I was that at a certain point, the love was still there, but we couldn't live with each other. We had, we clashed. But I, I know that I want to believe that he loved me and I loved him, but we just couldn't live together. You didn't talk to me too much about his personal life, uh, the background of his father and, and mother. But one knew that there was somewhere there was something that um, had hurt him in days gone by. Um, here was this man who was the king, uh, who overpowered really everybody he came in contact with. And yet you'd see him sometime sitting down and a glisten of tears would come to his eyes, and he would be thinking deeply about something. I knew that you, with all his bombast, 
was also a, a, a very human person who had been hurt and had now succeeded in largely covering up those wounds. Sloppy with your drink. You talk too much. quite amazing is his capacity of doing his role in Westworld really at the same level as he did his role in The Magnificent Seven. He didn't allow his self-image to go down. Even if all the signs, the exterior signs were pointing downwards and this was not a good phase in his career, he would not allow that to happen. sort of two tent poles at different, dramatically different points in his career, you know, with a Magnificent Seven and Westworld. Both characters, very similar. Both loners, both strong, tough men, one real, one a robot. But the heart in both of them came through in both movies. Even though in this one he's a robot. When they offered him to the, the role of the King and I and to bring it back to Broadway, I think it was a godsend. He had been waiting for a part, he really wanted to do something, and suddenly there was this material that was completely his, that he had done for years. In the very first rehearsal, so thrilled and excited to play the king again, he let his voice out full blast and damaged his vocal cords. And on the opening night that we had in Indianapolis, I barely knew him, but I was his Mrs. Anna, and he had profound laryngitis. I have never, ever in my life heard anyone with laryngitis where he couldn't even whisper. And so I proposed, having grown up backstage at The King and I and heard over 500 performances personally, that uh, he would do the performance on stage and I would provide his voice from a seat beside the conductor in the orchestra pit with a microphone. And his son Rock went into the pit and read the lines for him and he came on stage and gestured. And I told him, I said, all you have to do is go out in front of that audience, Mr. Brenner. They want to see you and you are the king and you will be the king for them. I went backstage to see him during the intermission and we embraced and you all still with no voice whispered to me, you must play the king older now, Rock. I'm older. You're playing him like the 30-year-old you are now, and I was then. But now it's an older king. He always would say about playing the king when I played it with him in the 70s, that he had finally grown into the role, that he was too young when he played it in 1951, and he had to make up for the role. He suddenly didn't have to make up for it anymore. The second time when we opened on Broadway, it was a resounding success. The critical response was overwhelming. We had standing room only audiences for two years at the Eurus Theater. Yule then went on to go to London when our show closed, and he was a great success in London at the Palladium. He then came back and he just couldn't give it up. It was, it was the great joy of his life, and he did it until practically the day that he died. And people didn't know when we danced on stage that he actually danced Shall We Dance, did the polka, 
with a limp. And so we both compensated for that limp that he had. He limped very badly off stage, but when he appeared on stage as the King of Siam, the King didn't limp, so he didn't limp. It's very difficult to say where the King ended and where Yul Brynner began, because he truly lived that role. And he loved the role of the King. In fact, this long list of, of uh, supposedly producers laments that were, were his demands that he had to have that was published, I think, in Variety. One of his demands was that he be always supplied the this year's automobile, a limousine, and it had to be the finest car in its line. And I asked him, I said, why did you require that of a, of a producer? And he said, my darling, can you imagine the car that a producer might give me if I didn't make this specific demand? And he said, do you know how disappointed my audience would be, my fans standing in the street as I drive out, if I drove out in an old Ford heap instead of a lovely big limousine which befitted the King of Siam? It was all a joke to him. I mean, it was all part of a role that he liked to play. He loved the fact that he was a star. He loved the fact that they sent the limousines for him, that he was making all this money. Because he had come from a place that there was no money. You like to live well. But I honestly think that if it all went, he could have, he could have lived with that too. Well, you, Brenner, just owned that role, I think, more than any actor that I've known in modern times has ever owned a role. I mean, he worked on his curtain call for The King and I, which is one of the great famous curtain calls of all time. He worked hours and weeks perfecting just exactly what he was supposed to do with that. It's the way he explained it to me. He said, it's a very difficult curtain call. He said, after all, he said, the man is dead. He said, I have to bring him back to life for the audience to do the curtain call. And of course it was the probably most uh, flagrant, uh, just absolutely, it just it was unbelievable, this curtain call. All the children would come out, they would bow. All the other people in the court would come out. The Lady Anna would come out and bow. Then they would all turn up stage and wait, and wait, and wait. And then the king would come out. And he would bow, and he would bow. And he'd turn, take the children and bow. All the time building, building, building until that moment when he suddenly threw his arms up and the audience almost jumped out of their seat. It was um, very interesting to see him deal with the king and I almost as a corset. It was something that held him together. It helped him face whatever pains he had in his personal life and whatever pains he had physically. He definitely had the back problems and those were excruciating and very difficult to deal with. He really considered himself this gypsy and, and that he came from this mysterious, romantic, dark world of the wandering nomadic gypsy. And somehow he believed it so strongly that you wanted to believe it too. Чертит неясный салет Твое лицо Я вижу вновь так близко Through my young ears I recall mainly this big hand holding my little hand in his hand and and reassuring about everything Алишит Твоя записка in his coming in and out of my life. It was always magic, it was always mystery. And he had this amazing career and he could solve everything and he was bigger than the other men. It was sort of this magical moment whenever he'd show up in my existence. When the 70s he married Jacqueline Thion Lachaume, who was a wonderful French woman. They desperately wanted children and couldn't have any. And it was at the time where Vietnam was at its peak and all these Vietnamese children were needing homes desperately. And he just thought it totally natural to take into our family two young Vietnamese infants who are my little sisters, Mia and Melody. And they were a great joy to him. He's always, he always had a very strong connection with very young children. And we found ourselves 
in separations with different wives and we were always there and somewhat our point of rally was obviously him and our love to him my little sisters um, had to face one divorce I had to face two divorces the one of my mother and having barely gotten used to the his third wife Jacqueline another divorce my brother saw three divorces so we all sort of went through it and rallied to his side and made our time with him special he loved his children I, I know that uh, he was devoted especially the, the two wives I knew well the two last ones marvelous French lady Jacqueline de la Chaume and then uh, Cathy Brenner, who worked with him as a principal dancer in uh, The King and I during the last long tour. He had all the passions and, and appetites and enormous elegance of a very secure male. Very few people that I've ever met were as male and secure in their masculinity as uh, Brenner. I remember we were talking about relationships and about missing people and so forth. And he said to me, well, he said, just remember this. He said, you're born alone, you live alone, you die alone, and anything in between is a favor. I recall very clearly the night that he called me. And he said, I don't have very good news. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, I have lung cancer. And I said, well, what is the, what is the status? And he said, they've given me three months to live. So from then on, it was a battle to defy this disease. And he kept on doing the king and I. The king and I gave him the structure, something to go to every day, something to fight for. It gave him two and a half years, which were two and a half years that we really hadn't hoped for. Well, every, everybody was after him for the news story. I mean, there was this man, this very well-known man who had cancer, who had announced it pretty officially, and who was still working. So he went on 60 Minutes, and it's something, he had always thought about this idea of doing a commercial. I really wanted to make a commercial when I discovered that I was that sick, and my time was so limited. I wanted to make that commercial that says simply, now that I'm gone, I tell you, don't smoke. Whatever you do, just don't smoke. If I could take back that smoking, we wouldn't be talking about any cancer. I'm convinced of that. She played until the 30th of June, when he gave his final performance at the Broadway Theatre. He made an appearance afterwards at a late night party and waved to the crowd. He then went to visit a dying friend in Los Angeles. All of this was agony, agony, and uh, took great bravery, and was dead uh, less than two and a half or three months later. I have never heard anyone since he came on the scene in the early 50s say, He's a young Yul Brenner. He's the new Yul Brenner. He's the next Yul Brenner. There's only one. I have never heard anyone compare another actor with him or compare what he could do with what anyone else could do. People who will live forever, from century to century. This Charles Chaplin, I can't at the moment think of how many there are, but one of those is certainly Yul Brynner. Yul Brynner will be remembered through the years. He was an original. I guess there was more to his relationship to the, to the part of the king than uh, originally met the eye, but whoever cast him uh, uh, not only uh, changed the fate of that altogether wonderful show, but it, it changed his life. I don't think any anything but the theater could have offered him a kingdom, and they did, and he, he took it. <laughs> 